he did in mine. I was born in 1952. Now that means that I'm 68 years old today. Boy, let me tell you what. It goes by in a blink. Don't let anybody fool you. You may be listening tonight. You might be 20 years old. You might be 30 years old. Well, guess what? You blink your eyes once or twice, you're going to be 68 too. And the people that are older than 68, they have a clear understanding of what I'm talking about. Man, it goes by. The Bible even says life is like a vapor, man. You're here one minute and it seems like it's all done by the next minute. Well, anyway, I was born into a Mormon household. My father was in the hierarchy as a high priest of the Mormon church back in Arkansas where I grew up. And from my birth, my father, my father had high hopes and very big plans for my life. Let me give you a little background. In the Mormon religion, the father of the family unit is the authority of the home and what he says goes. That's just the way it is. Uh, the Mormon religion also teaches that it's the only true religion in the world today. Now think about it. In a Mormon household, you're automatically baptized by the age of eight years of age. Whether you have a belief in God or not, you might say, why? why do they do? I mean, it's an automatic thing. When I, my, on my eighth birthday, along with other kids that had their eighth birthday, we all gathered together and we were baptized the same day. It is what they believe a safety net for children in the Mormon faith. I also became indoctrinated in what Mormons call the Aaronic Priesthood at a very early age. I became a deacon at the age of 12, I became a teacher at the age of 14, and I became a priest at the age of 16. Now, each of these offices that I had had certain responsibilities and works that had to be performed in order to advance in the Mormon religion. This is absolute truth. Maybe people don't know this, but the biggest difference between Mormonism and Christianity is that Mormonism is a works-oriented religion. It's not about grace. It's all about works. Hear me on that. It's not about grace, they'll teach. It's all about works. The things you do. Mormons believe if they work hard enough here in this world and they do the things that they're asked of as a Mormon, uh, that one day when they go to heaven and they believe in three different levels of heaven, I'm not going to go into that tonight because that's a whole doctrinal thing about it that they believe, but they got so many different levels of heaven, you'd be like, wow, everybody's going to make it. But they want to get to the highest point of heaven believing that one day, if they're good enough, God will give them a world to be a Lord over sometime. There's a lot of things that people don't understand about Mormonism. Matter of fact, I will say this even in the beginning. When I got saved, I asked God to help me forget everything I ever learned so that I could learn him brand new. Well, I began uh, preparing for mission work all throughout high school as I attended a Mormon seminary for four years now. I attended two hours of Mormon studies each Monday through Friday prior to attending public school. And man, let me tell you what, it was very demanding on me. I was planning, like other Mormon boys, for a mission trip for the Mormon church. You may not all know this, maybe you do, that all Mormon young men are requested to give two years of their, of their life to mission work from the ages of 19 to 21 to serve the church as a Mormon missionary, as an elder. You may see the boys even today here, even Okeechobee, you'll see them riding around their bicycles. These two boys, they'll have on white shirts and dark pants and a tie and they're on bicycles and they go two by two. Well, that's what I was planning to do. But um, after school, I was, a, after high school, I was approached by the high priest of our church stake and he suggested to me that as I prepare for my mission as a Mormon elder, that I should study about culture shock in different religions of the world. Now you might ask why. Well, here's the reason why. As a Mormon youth, you don't know where you're going to be headed to throughout the world as you leave on a mission trip. They never tell you until you're just about ready to go where you may end up in the world. So you would think, I'm going to come into some cultural differences most likely. I need to understand about different religions so when I go to confront them, I can use their religion against them. When I went through that, and as I was preparing the last full year before I was going to turn 19, something happened, and that's when my Mormon life experience really changed. Because as I was studying different religions of the world, I was amazed 
that there was a great number of other religions that, that claimed to be the only true religion, which is what all my life as a Mormon, I thought that Mormons, Mormonism was the only true religion, right? Well, I remember coming home and meeting with my father and I told him about this and I said, you know, Dad, I, I've got this problem and it's really perplexing. And I began to tell him about what I was learning about other religions that they too stress that they're the only true. I said, now, now, how can that be? Now, I don't know what happened and there was a lot more discussion besides just that. But my father got so angry with me, and he even told me after a length of time that I wasn't worthy to go on a mission. He decided I wasn't going. Now, I had saved money my whole life. I worked since I was about 12 years old on my dad's job, of all things. He was a, a, a general contractor. I used to go work for him during the summer, weekends, just to make money for what? Mission work that I was planning to go to. Well, it got really bad at our house, and, and my father, he was just so angry. He even got to the point where he didn't want to talk to me. Um, he kind of pushed me aside and it became very difficult even for me to be around him for a long time. He finally did something that I didn't expect. And I was, I was 18 years old. I was about to turn 19 and he told me that he wanted me to move out of the house and live on my own. He was just, he didn't want to have me around. And, uh, he just, he was too embarrassed. He was embarrassed just even watching me. And that really hurt. I mean, it did. And, it was difficult. So anyway, at 18, almost 19 years of age, instead of going on a mission, I was left on my own. And I found a place to live, and I went out really into the world. And let me tell you something. I determined that I realized that my church life as a Mormon was over. I believed that I, I wasn't going to be in any heaven. And I just, it, it was difficult. Now, my father did allow me to continue working with him and my brother, in their construction business. And I did that for as long as I could. I did it until I couldn't handle re the rejection anymore. So finally, uh, I went out into the world. I didn't have, like I said, a religion. I, I knew my heavenly work was over. I decided to find happiness on my own without God. And I lived in the world for a couple of years. Well, when I was 20 years of age, I was playing music in nightclubs, and it was during one of these gigs that I had that I actually met my wife, Diane. I didn't meet her in a nightclub, but I met her in this town that I was playing at. And uh, when I saw her, when she saw me, she fell in love with me right off the bat. I mean, it was, it was love at first sight, really, between the two of us. We both knew that there was something missing in our lives, and I, I thought maybe the best way to fill the void in my life uh, was by getting married and having kids. I thought, man, that would do it. Well, long since then, I have learned that by getting married and having children, it does complicate a few things in your life, right? But I thought, man, that's going to fill the void, and I was so happy to do that. And we dated for about six months. And then a couple years later, our son, Eric, was born about two years later, and we were a happy little family living in the confines of Little Rock, Arkansas, trying to make a happy life. But then after a couple of years, we learned that Diane's mom got sick with pancreatic cancer. And so we made a decision to move to her place in Lake Village. She lived in a little small trailer and we moved there so we could be her caregivers. Now it was 125 miles away from Little Rock where I grew up. But once we got there, we were just, like I say, living life. And, and that's when the next life-changing event in my life took place. Diane's brother, he, he's, a, he's a pastor. His name is Paul Payne. He'll, he may be on tonight. I, I didn't notice if he was. Uh, it may be, you know, he, you've seen him on. We pray for him an awful lot. And uh, I had, uh, he came to me one night and he asked me, he said, hey, I have a Southern Gospel group. Would you, uh, would you mind coming and playing bass guitar for us? Because we're looking for a bass guitar player. And I thought, well, I, I'm in this little small town. There's nothing to do on the weekend. And I, plus playing music, I'd love to do that. So sure, I'll do it. So I traveled with him and his gospel group. Now get this, I did it for a full year. I did it for a full year. And, and I, I just saw what Chris wrote. Kids don't complicate anything, laugh out loud. Boy, I hear you, Chris. Uh, anyway, I traveled with him for a year. And during that course of the year, I got to from a maybe a third you know, a background look, I could see uh, 
what these people were talking about in their life. I got to go with them on weekends, almost every weekend. They did these Christian songs, wonderful Southern gospel songs that I fell in love with. And also I got to hear preaching from Pastor Paul from time to time. And 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 I, I just, it became a very uh, unique time in my life. And but I'd watch them from behind the scenes, and and I and I got to experience firsthand how these Christians live. I noticed that they had something though, in their life that I did not have in my life, and that was peace. I mean, this peace that I, I really couldn't comprehend it. Uh, they had joy, and they had a seemingly a hope. Now, now they were living the, they were traveling with me. I got to see. Them. I mean, they're. They were seemingly no different than I was, but yet they had these things that I didn't have. And But it was something that I was desiring to have. What they didn't know is that during the week, I would, when I wasn't around them, I'd read the Bible. I'd check out these things that I was hearing preach. I'd check out these words in these songs, just trying to find some connection. Now, let me tell you something. You may never know who may be watching you. You might not even know that you're being checked out when you say you're a Christian, but let me tell you something, you are. You've heard this saying, you've probably heard it several times, you're the only Bible some people may ever read. Well, that's the way it was with me. With these folks, I watched them, man. I'm, I was with them when the bus broke down. I saw how that, I remember the bus broke down one time and I was concerned about getting home, you know, because I had to go to work like the next day and this was a Sunday night. And these folks, we had that bus break down and they got outside the bus and started praying started praying uh, for help. And I'm thinking, praying for help? Man, we need to get this bus fixed. We're, they're standing outside this bus, you know, holding hands, praying. I go out, I'm looking out, I don't believe this. Anyway, they're out there doing this, and all of a sudden, down the road we looked, and over this hill, now we were on a kind of an abandoned road, right, or on old highway, this, this car came up with lights toward us, and they said, uh, he, this man stopped and he said, hey, uh, are you guys having trouble? And the leader of our group said, yeah, we're having some trouble and we need to get this thing fixed real quick. He said, well, listen, I'm a pastor, but, you know, I, I rarely come down this road, but I happen to go by and see a friend. I just happen to be coming down this road. I happened to go by and visit one of my members who's sick, and I thought, well, I'll just take the shortcut home. And he came by where we were. <laughs> And he said, well, how can I help you? And apparently he was also a mechanic. It didn't take much. He had that thing fixed. We got on the road and came home. I, I was like, do you believe that? They pray and things happen? Wow. How does that happen? <laughs> oh, my, my. Well, anyway, uh, it went on like that for about a year. I got to check things out. Uh, uh, you know, I wasn't a bad person. And, and... I was a really good guy. I, my problem was I didn't want another religion. I I didn't want to do something with another religion that maybe caused me to lose it again. I just didn't want to take that risk. But one weekend while we were traveling, we were at an all-day Southern Gospel singing. And uh, there was a large number of Southern Gospel groups there. And it was kind of like what you would experience with like a Gaither homecoming type event. Um, and... While we were there, uh, I was outside helping get our musical instruments ready and everything, and a guy approached me. This man walks up to me, and he, he, I'd seen this guy at some other singings before, and he, we began to have a discussion, and he said to me, he said, hey, buddy, he said, you sing like a good guy, you know. He said, and he was talking about my guitar playing, which at the time was my favorite subject, I'm going to be honest. Uh, but he said to me, but, you know, I sense that there's something about your life that just doesn't seem right. And I thought, what? Well, it was during the course of that discussion. I had heard the gospel now for about a year. But I was there were some complications with it. One of the things that I didn't understand, and I guess because of my background of, of doing works, I didn't understand grace. I didn't understand really what lostness was. Well, during that discussion... He caught my attention when he said something to me. He said, you know, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship. It's about a relationship with Jesus as a personal Savior. He told me then what it means to be lost and the importance about being saved. And I got it. Somehow, and I guess it was just God's way, I got it and I wanted it. 
He told me how to be saved by swapping my sin for God's son. It's something I even talk about to this day, the importance of swapping your sin for God's son, to, to, to recognize your loss and desire salvation. I'm telling you what, the moment I learned I was lost, it didn't take me, and, and that took a year, it didn't take but just a few seconds to want to be saved. Well, he took the time to talk to me, and then he led me in prayer. And he asked me to pray along with him, and I did. And he asked, and I asked, I remember asking Jesus to come into my heart. I remember asking him to become my Lord and my Savior. Savior and Lord. You know, uh, I know how to spell the word Lord. You know how you spell it? You spell Lord, B-O-S-S. I'm so glad I learned that because I'm going to tell you, if he's not the boss of your life, then he's not the Lord of your life. And if he's not the Lord of your life, he's not the Savior of your life. I think he has to become Lord as well as Savior. Savior is what he does. Lord is who he is. And, and I believe that. I, 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 I did then. I still believe it now. He became the Lord of my life. You know how to spell the word, how to spell the name Jesus? You spell Jesus like this. L-O-V-E. That's how you spell Jesus. You know how you spell the word love? O-B-E-Y. And listen, you have to obey what he calls you to do in order to be right with him. You have to have an understanding that this is who he is, Lord. And again, I tell you, if he's not Lord, you need to make him Lord. Well, we went on the stage after I had prayed this prayer and we went on stage and, and as, as I was getting ready, I put my bass guitar on. We was getting ready to play, play. Brother Paul was up front. He was, he was the bass singer for the group and, and the lead singer, his name was Dave. Well, Dave went up and got on the microphone. He had heard about what I did outside. Now we're in a crowd of hundreds and hundreds of people, right? And a lot of these well-known gospel groups stand out in front of us. He said, do you see this bass player back here? He just prayed to receive Jesus Christ and got saved. Oh my word, let me tell you what. Uh, the plays broke out and just it was just almost crazy. It broke out in such a an expressive praise and worship. I I, I was beside myself. It it was something, man. My life and I knew when I prayed. Matter of fact, there was something I asked God to do. I asked Him again to help me forget everything I ever thought I knew of Him, so I could learn Him fresh and new. And I've been doing that now for forty six years. I mean, it's it's just something. Well. It was after that, when that happened, that my desire, my desire was to share the good news of Jesus Christ with my family. Now, my wife was saved as a little girl, and I'm amazed that God even allowed her to marry me. But you know what my wife did? My wife rededicated. It was great. And, and I tell you what, we, we raised our son up in a Christian home. My son was saved at the age of seven, and I, I won't go into that much, but wow, our whole family got saved. It was, it was just interesting time in my life, and I just praise the Lord. But there was somebody in the back of my mind, above anybody else, that I wanted to share the Word of God with, and that was my father. And you know what? Uh, it was hard because he didn't want anything to do with me. He really did, and he didn't want to talk to me. I, I, I try to call him on the phone sometimes, and he just hang up. My mother would call me back and talk to him. My mamas are that way, right? They love your children no matter what. And uh, anyway, I had this great desire. Well, years later, and I hadn't talked to my dad at this point, probably in about seven years, uh, there was another life-changing event that took place in my life. Um. I want to share with you my life verse, may I? It's uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, and it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. He'll direct that path. He will. After receiving Christ, I surrendered to the ministry. I was ordained. I began preaching. I began pastoring. And I love the pastor. You know, Pastor Mike says that all the time. You know, he loves to preach. I love the pastor. Well, I, I accept that. Well, it was about a couple years later after I was ordained that I had this other special encounter, life-changing. 
I was working as a carpenter in Lake Village. It was kind of, I had a job as a pastor, but I was also working uh, on, a, on a, a job. And uh, I, was, I was working as a, as a carpenter, and I loved that job. Well, uh, one day as I, I was out on the job site, I look out and, and I saw a truck that I thought was familiar driving toward me. Guess what? It was my father's truck. Now, I don't know how he found out where I was. He was 125. He lived 125 miles from me. I don't know how he found out where I was. We didn't have cell phones back then. We're talking in the 70s, guys. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have the technology, you know. Um, if you didn't have a landline, you didn't talk to anybody, you know, on the phone. But um, anyway, he uh, he shows up, and I, I noticed, and I realized it was his truck, and he pulled up to my job site, and he's just sitting there with the truck running. Well, I got enough courage because I was, I was startled. I walked out there and I, I, he rolls down his window, right? Rolls down his window. He says, get in the truck. I thought, get in the truck. I said, okay. So I got in the truck. Well, as I'm walking around the truck, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, my mom must have died. That's the only thing I could think. Well, I got in the truck and he, he said, listen, I want to talk to you, but I want you to listen. I don't want you to say anything. Now, again, he was being very authoritative, right? And as my father, I said, okay. You know, the Bible says, honor your mother and father, right? Well, this, he's, he says, I want you to listen. I said, okay. Well, he held up this cassette tape. Now, I'm really dating myself really bad. He held up a cassette tape, and he had one of those portable cassette tape players, right? He said, I want you to listen to this, okay? He said, this was sent to me. I don't know who sent it to me, but I want you to listen to this tape. Now, I had been praying for years. How can I ever witness to my father? He pushes in this, this tape, and for the next 25 minutes, it's a tape of me sharing the gospel and singing gospel songs. He, I was preaching about my life change from Mormonism to Christianity in the realm of that tape. I was stunned. I was thinking, oh, my word. And some things started going through my mind. I'm like, oh, wow. Uh, I, I thought, you know what? He's got a gun on the other side of that seat he's sitting in, and he's going to blow my brains out. I mean, it, it was kind of thoughts. It was going, uh, things were racing in my head. When he got done, he looked at me, and he said, son, he said, I want to tell you something. I have had this tape for about six months. I've listened to it time after time after time. And I want to say something to you, and I'm still listening. I'm like, wow. He says, and this is something he said to me, and it's almost forgotten phrases in our English language today. He says, son, I love you. Now, I haven't heard my dad say that in years. I love you. I'm so sorry how I've treated you over the years. Can you ever forgive me? And while he did that, while he was sharing that, the Lord just came over my heart. My prayer was being answered. How can I share with my father? And here he's had this tape listening about me for six months. I was like, wow, thank you, Jesus. When he said, can, I, can you ever forgive me? This is how I answered him. And I can only take note by how I know Jesus is with me. I said, Dad, I'm just like Jesus, and I'm quick to forgive. And oh, my word, let me tell you, it's just, it just a flood came between the two of us. And we sat there and cried, and he just hugged on me and loved me. And it was amazing. It was, I just can't help but get emotional about it every time I think of it. So anyway, he uh, he said something to me that I would have never dreamed to hear come out of his mouth. He said, you know what? I think the Jesus you know is not like the Jesus I know. Will you tell me more about the Jesus you know? Oh, my word. I said, well, he opened the door, right? For the next 20 minutes or so, I shared with him the good news of Jesus Christ. 
I shared with him that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man can come to the Father but by him. I, we went down the Romans road. We did. We talked about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I was pulling things really just through my spirit to him about Jesus. And when it was all said and done, I said to him, Dad, just like that guy that approached me, I said, Dad, I know this is missing in your life. Would you like to pray to receive Jesus? Now, let me tell you how big a miracle this is. My dad was 75 years old. All his life, he'd been stemmed to Mormonism. I mean, he was really into it. And he looked at me and said, yes, son, I'd like to receive Jesus in my heart like you're talking about. So I prayed with him and I led him and I asked him to pray. And he did. He prayed to ask Jesus to come into his life. He prayed for Jesus to be the Lord. And wow, I'm going to tell you something. That was an amazing moment. That was a miracle. And I thank God to this day about it. Now, I'm running close on time and I want to try to finish this. So anyway, he says to me, he says, listen, can we, uh, can you go home with me? Now we're 20, 125 miles away, at least a three and a half hour drive. He said, can you go home with me? I'll bring you back tonight. I want to tell your mom about this experience today. And I, and, and I said, oh, absolutely. So you know what we did? We went by my wife's office. She was working as a, in the medical field there in Lake Village at the time. And I said, well, listen, my dad's here. I'm going to go home with him. I'll be back tonight. And uh, there's just something that we need to do together. And she was amazed because she was, when she saw my dad driving it with me, I think she probably thought, boy, my mother must have died, just like I thought. Well, we said okay, and we took off to Little Rock. And during that whole three-hour drive, uh, he uh, he was just going off on how different he felt how he felt like a burden was lifted off of him and how how it was just God reigning into his life and and he said I can't wait I can't wait to get home and tell your mother about this I said oh me too dad I want to be able to hear you tell her about it so anyway we pull up into uh his front yard and get out of the truck and we're walking up toward the porch there at my mom's house and she looks out and she got real nervous because when she saw me walk with my dad knowing I hadn't talked to him in such a long time her thought was Oh my goodness, Diane must have died. My wife, you know, Diane. And when she opened the door, I said, No, no, mom, nothing like that, but we do have something to share with you. So we walked in the house and I looked at I looked at my dad and he said, Okay, Mike, share with her what happened. And I thought, Well, Dad, you said you was gonna share. You know, I mean it was a great I did. I shared then what took place and my dad confirmed it. Let me tell you what happened. My mom, seventy three years old at the time, that same day. She prays to receive Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you, life doesn't get any better than that. I just thank Jesus that he gave me the time, that gave me the moment, gave me the opportunity to share that with him. Well, I didn't say this in the beginning, but the Mormons usually have large families. I have 12 brothers and sisters. And I'm the youngest boy in that family. Now, uh, since then, I learned a very valuable lesson. And I had already led one of my brothers to Christ, David. I would already uh, was instrumental in, a couple, in one of my sisters getting saved at that time. And then uh, I had another sister of the name of Ruby. She, she got saved. I didn't have really anything other than just pray for her. But she, she met someone that led her to faith in Christ. And, and, you know, out of, out of the 13 kids so far, nine of us have gotten saved. Which means there's four of them still out there. Guess what? I've been praying for them for 46 years. I mean, it's, you just don't stop praying for them. Just don't. When you think that you're tired of praying for somebody, get back with it. If you think there's no hope for someone, man, stick with it. My father's life changed. It really did. Matter of fact... Let me tell you some of the, real quick, what some of the changes were like. My dad, as far back as I could remember up to that point, always wore a white long sleeve shirt and black pants. Uh, that's just what he wore. And it was because of his Mormonism. I know what it was. He just was so constrained to that. And he got saved. Do you know what happened to my father? He started wearing shirts like plaid shirts. 
and started, he went and bought him a green jumpsuit. I've never seen anything like that on him. My dad took up some things that he had I'd never dreamed at 75. He took up bowling. <laughs> Crazy. He decided he was going to learn to play the organ. And you know, uh, not long after he got saved and he worked on that, one night he shows up to my church on Sunday night. He says, son, let me show you how I'm learning. And we had an organ in our church. Son, let me show you what I'm learning on the organ. He started playing and man, it was how great thou art. And I was like, oh my word. Well, it's been an amazing trip. And I'm going to tell you what happened though. A year later, my father died from a stroke with complications from a car wreck actually that he had. And uh, I will say this, in the number of years that we were not associated with one another, God more than made up the time for me that last year of his life. And I know my father's in heaven. My mother died not long after that, and I know she's in heaven. Like I say, I have a couple of brothers and sisters that have, that have died, and I know they're in heaven. And that just gives me a great peace. But let me tell you, don't give up on people. Don't do it. Just just hang in there. Well, it's uh it's been an interesting life, I'll tell you. And God's been so good to me. And we have a, a, a my wife's family who I dearly love. They they really took me under their wing and 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 mentored me and made sure that I was, you know, following uh in the footsteps that I should as a Christian. And uh it just gave me great hope. I uh I just thank God for it all. Well, that's really my testimony. Uh, and again, your testimony is just the life you have in Christ. I'm going to encourage you to go out and share it. Now listen, tonight, you may be in the kind of shape my father was in. Uh, you may be uh, lost as a goose. <laughs> you might be in a situation that you just don't have any hope at all. You wonder, you know, if at all, how can it possibly come to me? How can I have peace? There's only one way, and that's to trust in Jesus as your Lord. If you don't know the Lord tonight, I'm going to encourage you to do that. I want you to pray something like this if you really want him. Just go to him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm so sorry for the sin in my life. And just like Pastor Brooks, I want to swap my sin for your son. Please, Lord, come into my heart. Become my Lord. Be my Savior. And then, Father, just help me grow in you. And just say that prayer in the name of Jesus, and I believe you'll get saved. I tell you what, uh, you may be here tonight also. Maybe you've been saved, but you know that your testimony is not the way it should be. You know that you need Jesus. Well, I tell you, I'm going to play a song in just a moment. And during this song, I just want you to do this. I want you to just give your heart to Christ and ask him to make all things right. Uh if you would, put your name on the screen. If I don't catch it, we'll catch it tomorrow. But I just want to encourage you, like Pastor Mike would do, put your name.